Hi, everyone, and welcome to day three of uh, IGF. Uh, we're very excited to have you here, and we're here to talk about a very, very important issue and something that a lot of us have been facing over the years. Uh, we, the name of the session is Help, the Kill Switch is Taking Away My Limited Agency. Uh, Software Freedom Law Center, a digital rights organization based out of New Delhi, India, is hosting this session. And my name is Radhika. Uh, I work as the Internet Shutdown's lead at the center. And I'll be the moderator for the day. Uh, before I introduce the, mod, uh, the other panelists for the session, I would like to give you a little bit of context on what this um, session is about, because I understand that the name might be slightly ambiguous. So I'll start with something very personal, because I really believe that shutdowns or any kinds of barrier to information are, right? This, uh, this year is 2021, the capital of the world's largest democracy, wild-scale farmers' protests, which I'm, I think a lot of you might be following, were there. Right. There are people out on the streets, and India is known for its, its beautiful, vibrant mass movements. People love coming out of the streets, people love protesting. And there are all sorts of people uh, there on the streets protesting. And then snap, the kill switch has been turned down. There is no internet. This is the capital city of the country. The public transportation has completely stopped. There are women on the streets trying to find their way back home with nothing to their disposal. There are no taxis, there are no metros, and we are an unsafe society. Like we, you know, uh, I'm sure a lot of you have heard this term that Delhi is the rape capital of the world, right? So we feel unsafe while we're on the street. And when there is nothing around, no public transportation, we rely a lot on, you know, sharing our uh, live locations, using app-based uh, services like Ola's, Ubers, and there is nothing. It's becoming nighttime. Women are standing on the street. There, you can't call the police. There are no taxis. The metro, which is pretty, you know, widespread, is not working. And there is no information on what's happening because your internet is not working. So, you know, our parents start calling. Our parents, our loved ones, they're calling, right? And we're not very pro-protests. So, in our families, we're told, oh, don't go out. Don't go out to protest. Don't go out to participate in a mass movement. But we defy and we go. And then, when they can't reach us, they're also panicking, right? Uh, you feel like you are unsafe, and that makes you not want to take you know, participate in a mass movement here on. And this is exactly what internet shutdowns do. This is a direct, undocumented, untalked about impact of shutdowns. And this is why we have to talk about them. We have a wonderful panel of experts today to help us understand and move further along the journey of fighting the kill switch. Uh, before we begin, I would like to put a number to the shutdowns that have taken place in 2021 itself. Access now documented 182 shutdowns in 34 countries. I will repeat, 184, 182 shutdowns in 34 countries. I would have actually like bought a sink if I was, if I was Elon Musk to let that number sink in. But... Uh, but this is the number, and hundreds of which those have happened in our country, right? Uh, and without further ado, I would like to introduce our panelists who are doing wonderful work in their area. Uh, we have Maria. Maria is the research lead of Open Observatory of Network Interference and is the one who, track, uh, who uh, you know, tracks a lot of blocking that we have seen. Uh, we have Oliver Spencer. Oliver Spencer an is an advisor to Free Expression Myanmar and closely works in areas of speech there. We have Prashant Sugathan. Prashant is the legal director of SFLC.in. He's a lawyer by training and has successfully fought against shutdowns in courts. We have our very own Felicia, who is the Keep It On lead of, with Access Now and will, is one of the front fighters against shutdowns. The, and last but not the least, we have Arzak Khan. Arzak belongs to Balochistan in Pakistan, one of the areas in the world that sees the worst kind of shutdowns. He is a cybersecurity expert and is also part of Innovation to Change Network. Uh, the format of the panel is we will have five minutes of introductory remarks where we will let all of our speakers introduce their regions as well as what they have seen in, 
in their regions with shutdowns, their fights against it, and the way that they have been, uh, you know, advocating against shutdowns. And because we're, um, uh, and because Felicia is right here, and there is nobody else who can explain shutdowns better to us, uh, I'm going to, you know, hand it over to Felicia. Thank you very much, um, Radhika, for the overview of this important issue we are coming to discuss here. And you've already given a snapshot of how internet shutdowns affect us in unimaginable ways. And so, um, my name is Felicia Antonio. I'm the Keep It On campaign manager at Access Now. Access Now is a global human rights organization, and we promote digital rights around the world. So, Keep It On simply means keep the internet on. And this is a campaign that was started in 2016 and currently unites over 280 organizations around the world. I think about 105 countries globally. And we work in solidarity to push back against internet shutdowns. Um, so what exactly are internet shutdowns? They happen when people in authority um, restrict access to the internet, to electronic communications um, platforms in order to silence a particular group of people in a particular location. And so um, a, an internet shutdown can happen as a complete blackout. And this means that there is no internet access at all. You cannot access any of the electronic communication platforms. So like social media is turned off, um, internet connectivity itself is off, or you can also slow down the speed, which is very frustrating because people will not be able to access platforms online, would not be able to send like documents, upload videos and share images online. And then we have a situation where social media, which has become a place where a lot of people mobilize during protests or to discuss important national issues would be turned off. And so you cannot message each other on WhatsApp, Facebook or Twitter or any other platforms that you use to communicate among yourselves. And these shutdowns don't just happen on a day that is normal. They happen when, as Radhika said, you are out on the streets protesting against whatever that is happening in your country, and then the internet is shut down. How do you get home? How do you find the safe places to, the safe routes to use to get home? Sometimes it happens when there's an active conflict and you don't know, maybe you were in, with a group of friends, you went out just a normal Tuesday night or Friday night, and then the internet is turned off and there's chaos in the streets. You can't find your friends, your parents are trying to call you and you are not able to um, reach them and they would obviously be worried. And the worrying thing is that this is a global problem. Radhika has indicated how many shutdowns we documented. In 2020, during the global pandemic, we thought, okay, the governments or authorities were telling us, go online, work from home, avoid public spaces, um, use digital platforms to continue your work because we couldn't all just stop working. That would be chaotic for the world. Yet we had 159 internet shutdowns happening in 29 countries. And you just wonder what happened to the lives of the people that were asked to go online to access the equal opportunities that those were those people that were in areas where the internet was accessible, what happened to education, healthcare, uh, businesses that happen online. And we know a lot of people are going online now to fend for their families or their dependents to provide for their families. People, um, we've um, collected stories from people in the Cox's Bazaar region where someone actually said, I don't have access to education. Google is where I learn to just understand what is happening around the world. And so, such places have been targeted with internet shutdowns. And we've seen minority groups, vulnerable communities being um, affected by these shutdowns. And recently we've seen internet shutdowns happening um, during conflict situations. And um, we've seen this happening from Myanmar to Ethiopia's Tigray region where we, um, we are in Ethiopia currently. Um, there's um, Pakistan, and I'm glad that we have some of the panelists that would highlight what has been happening there. And the concerning issue is that these shutdowns don't just happen within hours. They are being, there are shutdowns that have happened over years. Shutdowns started 2020 and they are still ongoing. And the devastating thing is that 
they affect us in different ways, and I'll be talking about that um, very soon. But the highlight is that internet shutdowns prevent journalists and human rights defenders from documenting what is happening during the crisis um, situation. They also exacerbate humanitarian crisis during conflicts, and um, we've seen this in various parts of the world, and I'll speak to that soon as well. But one thing that I want us to learn or ponder over throughout this session is the fact that it disconnects people from their loved ones. There is a crisis happening, and maybe you are in a different part of the world or in a different part of the city, and you cannot speak to your mom. That's your mom. You talk to your mom when you want to speak to her, not when you are able to speak to her. And she wants to know how you are doing, but you don't have the luxury to be able to speak to her because communication has been shut down. And we recently saw an example um, from the WHO director that said how the internet shutdown that is happening in Tigray is affecting his communication with his family. And this is not just um, a story, like one story. This is what we've documented around the world. And I think it's important for us to raise awareness about how much these shutdowns affect people, the impacts that they are having, and our lives have become interconnected online, whether we like it or not. And so let's use this opportunity to look at how we can actually identify ways and means of an advancing online rights and also at the same time adapting measures to ensure that we tackle the challenges that would obviously come with the growth of technology, with digital tools, with internet and all the, um, the, the technology that is making our lives um, go online rather than looking at how we can restrict um, the lines that people enjoy on, online. So thank you very much and yes. I hand over back yeah. to you. Thank you, Felicia. I do think that, you know, a lot of experience, like women as, I mean, we have very limited agency in the world, right? More so in our regions of global south, in Africa. And the minute that you shut down the internet, you know, something as simple as, you know, looking up a YouTube video to learn a simple dish you're taking away from people. That's the limited autonomy that you have in, in a lot of in parts of this world and we're taking away that and I think that's 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 heartbreaking if nothing else uh, Oliver I would like to come to you next maybe you could tell us a little bit about uh, what's happening in Myanmar and how have we seen uh, you know internet shutdowns impacting people there sure oh thanks Radhika thanks for um, having me here so I work for free expression Myanmar which is um a local CSO in Myanmar um, with all my colleagues that are spread uh, in Myanmar and, and, and across the world. Um, as you will know, Myanmar had a very long internet shutdown um, that lasted in the end 18 months. Um, right now uh, in, in Myanmar, we have um, internet shutdowns of various degrees across 54 townships. Um, so those are um, internet shutdowns where the internet is completely turned off um, and internet shutdowns where 2G is turned on, uh, which as most people know is basic, basically means you cannot do anything uh, on the internet really with the exception of maybe um, the occasional electronic message. Um, so to give you an idea, 54 townships in a country like Myanmar, we're talking six and a half million people uh, without um, with intermittent or without access to the internet um, and that's out of a population of 55 million so we're talking 12 percent of the population doesn't have uh, real access to the internet as we speak um, it is given the, the the scale and obviously we're talking a long time here because the coup in Myanmar started back in February 2021 so we're talking really uh, extended shutdowns um, Within this situation, it often becomes very difficult to identify um, the impact upon marginalized groups because internet shutdowns, obviously, you know, the, the nature of them is that they are blanket shutdowns um, and they apply across um, massive populations. And also, um, you know, that um, and in addition to that, it becomes very difficult to access information about what's happening because without access to the internet, it's very difficult to communicate, particularly with conflict states. 
most of the places in Myanmar that um, have shutdowns are involved in conflicts, intermittent or continuous conflicts. So there's a, a, a close relationship between internet shutdowns and conflicts in, in, in Myanmar. Um, one reason for this obviously could be a, that the, the military, this is the national military, the Burmese military, um, is basically trying to use internet shutdowns when they are doing offensives against the opposition forces, the revolutionary forces. So they're trying to prevent the tactical, the spread of tactical information about where the military is moving, um, for example. Um, I mean, obviously, this is because in Myanmar, there is a, a mass uprising against the military. So, you know, the military only has to pass through a village for everyone in that village to want to tell uh, the revolutionary uh, forces what is happening. So internet shutdowns is part of that trying to um, stop uh, coordinated opposition. But of course, it's also about concealing uh, human rights violations and preventing people from organizing against against the coup in, 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 in Myanmar. Um, human rights um, 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 violations, we're talking things like airstrikes, mortar bombardments, we're talking about detentions, extrajudicial killings, um, destroying and burning of villages, looting property. I mean, all of the war crimes and crimes against humanity are all happening under the, under the concealment of the internet shutdowns. Um, and it's also forcing people in these areas to use traditional phone calls, face-to-face -face meetings, and that's much easier for the military to then use their surveillance, um, you know, to do traditional surveillance, to, to listen in on phone calls, to have people sitting in cafes, listening to people talking, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, um, you know, it also undermines people's ability to, to deal with the conflict because obviously they lack information to make to make decisions about what's happening, where the conflict is, whether to run, whether to flee or not. Um, going back to the marginalized groups. So within this framework, if you're trying to understand what the impact of these shutdowns can be on, on marginalized groups, the first thing to say is that many of these conflicts are happening in ethnic minority areas. So um, we've got entire ethnic groups that have basically lost access to any kind of information or communication amongst themselves or with each other. So we've got a marginalized ethnic group that is, um, you know, uh, discriminatorily uh, affected compared to others. Um, we've also got the fact that most of these shutdowns now, since the coup is in, you know, later stages, let's say, um, most of these shutdowns are in predominantly rural areas, which are poorer. So then you've got another uh, overly affected group, which is the um, poor people, um, you know, uh, less economically developed groups. Um, and this has significant um, effects on their access to health care, their access to education, their access to housing, their access to work, their access to trade. Um, so this uh, obviously then makes the uh, lack of economic development even worse within these areas. Um, you know, there's um, particularly when we think about education in regards to COVID, um, because these shutdowns are long term, and even if they're not entirely off, but just 2G, obviously you can't do anything in regards to education there. So, you know, the expectation is that these marginalized groups are going to face profound long term impacts in regards to their education. Um, you know, they will have um, lower qualifications, lower employment um, potential. Um, probably um, there's the um, additional effect of increased child labor because obviously if they can't access education, they need something to do. They are, they are in economically deprived situations. Um, there is also some, um, some of our partner groups are also um, wondering whether it also has an effect, um, a, a, a gendered effect, um, a disproportionate impact on, on girls in particular, um, both in terms of their access to health, but also in regards to the education, as I mentioned, and the fact that um, girls are more likely to be um, then sent by uh, their families if they can't reach access education, they're more likely to be sent into labour or um, in some cases we're hearing about um, increases in, in, in child marriage that, um, you know, kind of consequential of the fact that there's no internet, which makes no education. And then, you know, you get an increases in things like um, early marriage and, and, and early motherhood, um, which obviously will have a, a long term impact on these, um, on these uh, marginalized 
uh, groups. Um, so that's everything from, from Myanmar back, back to you, Radhika. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Oliver. We have been like looking at the Myanmar situation, and it's it's scary. I mean, in one of the uh, you know in one of the interviews that I took, a woman uh, from a conflict region in the world actually said that she had to leave her education and come back home because her parents could not send money uh, for you know fees and like ACO and things like that to you know to continue her education. Uh, coming to you, Prashant, uh, as uh, India is an anomaly in the kind of shutdowns, the method of shutdowns that we see. Uh, how do you see, uh, you know, how do you see the fight against these shutdowns, especially in, a, in like a, in a country that's leading the number of shutdowns? Thanks, Radhika. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I mean, uh, we, we could even depend upon which time zone you are joining from. Uh, thanks to join me all uh, in this great conference and this a great session that's been organized. Okay, see, uh, Radhika asked about this uh, situation in India and what it's been doing to fight this kind of, uh, <coughs> sorry, shutdowns in India. See, uh, what we have been seeing is that the number of shutdowns in India has been going up year on year. For the last uh, almost five years, we have seen shutdowns above, let's say, 100 numbers. If you look at 2020, we had around uh, 132 shutdowns, 2021, 101, and in 2022 till now, 73 shutdowns. Now, why these numbers are important is that if you look at 2021 and 22, these are years when we had the pandemic. And all of us could continue with our lives, thanks mostly to the internet. Whether it is, uh, let's say, ordering something online, getting your work done, maybe uh, using a VPN, getting connected to your office and getting to make sure that you are in touch with your colleagues, uh, being on a video call. In some cases, uh, with lawyers depended a lot on the internet because all the, in India, almost all the courts shifted to the online platform. So it was in this kind of situation that we had such huge numbers of shutdowns. So what we did initially when uh, we started documenting these shutdowns from the year 2012, uh, if you look at our website, which is uh, internetshutdowns.in, uh, we keep a track of all the shutdowns happening in various states of India. One problem that we face while documenting these shutdowns is that, I mean, unlike in other countries uh, where the shutdowns are uh, mostly across the country, here in India, shutdowns happen in very small regions. Could be in a small district or could be in, let's say, a, 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 let's say a region smaller than a district even. And it's very difficult to track these shutdowns using a technical tool. So that's why we offer a reporting mechanism where either people report to us or we use secondary sources like newspaper reports and other reports in the media. And based on this, we update our tracker on a, I mean, it's not a real-time tracker, but almost a real-time, as soon as we get the reports, we update our tracker. Now, this tracker has been useful in, very, uh, in a big manner because almost all the media houses, uh, anybody reporting on shutdowns in India rely on this tracker. And it has been used by policymakers also to make the government aware, make parliamentarians aware about the problem with these shutdowns. The number of, the huge number of shutdowns that's happening in India, that itself is an eye-opener for people. So when we tell them that India is like uh, the number one when it comes to shutdowns across the world. I mean, that's not a great statistic to have. And when the government talks about initiatives like Digital India, where they want everyone to be on the internet, use it for uh, providing government services, and then you suddenly have this kind of shutdowns across the country. Definitely that is not in tune with the objectives of the government, what they proclaim to be their objectives. So that definitely is an issue. And how we have been doing is one, by raising awareness about the issue, by, uh, let's say, by the tracker and by all the policy initiatives that we have. Then also by means of litigation. We have been fighting these shutdowns in various courts across the country. Now, recent problems that we have seen is, see, uh, there are two cases in which uh, shutdowns can be imposed. I mean, as per the law, uh, it is well, if you have a public emergency or if it is in the interest of public safety. But we have now seen cases where even for preventing cheating in examinations, internet is being shut down. That is a major problem. So it's not just for, let's say, public safety or a public emergency situation that internet is being shut down. 
For us, in the reason as for preventing cheating in examination, this is the first thing that is being done. So that's one reason where we have approached the Supreme Court. Now, uh, that was a recent litigation. The matter is still pending before the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has asked the government of India to come up with any standard operating procedures that they have to, to tell the court, I mean, how do they decide this? How is that to decide that this is a case where an internet shutdown has to be imposed? So we are waiting for the results of that. So uh, that's one major problem like um, that we have seen over the years. Again, if you look at the kind of impact the, these shutdowns had, definitely just uh, affected students a lot. Uh, we document the experience of uh, let's say people who are affected by the shutdowns in our website. So one major concern that uh, we have seen is that students often can't even apply for examinations, appear for examinations because they can't uh, I mean, uh, get their applications done on time. Then we have seen cases where businessmen find it difficult to even submit their tender documents to apply for government tenders, government contracts. So it's across the spectrum how uh, this affects people. And definitely more so, Radhika specifically explained the case of marginalized communities, women particularly, how they find it difficult. And some, well, uh, if you look at internet as a medium, that definitely has given a lot of options for marginalized communities uh, to express themselves, to make themselves heard. So when a shutdown like this happens, definitely it is their freedom of speech and expression which gets uh, disrupted, which gets affected. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you, Prashant. This reminds me of a very funny incident that happened. So there was a very long shutdown in the state called Haryana and uh, uh, during like another one of the farmers protest and this university uh, says and, and students could not have obviously appear for online exams this is peak pandemic the university writes to you know says that either you know you appear for the exam online will not postpone it or you come to university to give it so and india is a huge country so that means that people are in different kind of different states and they're giving their exams online so they want students to come in a period of 12 hours to another state to give an exam because they can't give you internet. Yeah, and like, you know, it's a lot of it is uh, equal amounts of funny and equal amounts of traumatic. But um, uh, uh, so, uh, Maria, I would like to come to you next. Uh, Uni has been doing some wonderful, wonderful work around uh, network measurements. Uh, have you seen, I mean, uh, how uh, I think we would we would like our audience to understand how does uni actually work, and B have you seen like uh, like you know uh, websites and like blockage more in terms of women, like websites of people belonging to women in ma and the and you know the marginalized group section. Over to you. Thank you, Radhika, and hello everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you all. Uh, my name is Maria, and I work with the Open Observatory of Network Interference, which is commonly referred to as UNI. And UNI is a free software project that started 10 years ago in 2012, and our goal is to enable anyone to be able to independently investigate different forms of internet censorship. Uh, to this end, we build free and open source uh, software tools called UNIPROBE, which you can install on your mobile phone and also on your laptop, and you can use the software in order to run a variety of different uh, experiments to detect various forms of internet censorship on your network. And um, to the, right now, today, uh, our tools are been run by hundreds of thousands of people in 241 countries around the world. And the way it works is that their test results are automatically published as open data in order to increase transparency of internet censorship around the world. Over the last 10 years, we've had the opportunity to collect and publish as open data more than a billion network measurements, shedding light on many forms of internet censorship around the world. And based on, based on this data, we uh, regularly publish research reports documenting censorship events, uh, but this data also supports other research and advocacy efforts. Based on this data, we have observed very clear patterns with regards to when new and uh, increased levels of censorship tend to uh, emerge. On the one hand, the one very clear pattern that we have observed over the last five years is that 
uh, access to major social media platforms is commonly blocked during political events, such as during elections, uh, protests, and, and other moments of political transition, and also during conflicts. And also during these political moments, we tend to observe complete internet connectivity shutdowns. Now, such social media blocks and internet connectivity shutdowns uh, do have an impact on marginalized communities uh, in those countries, as has been documented extensively through research of other organizations. Uh, for example, looking at the impact of such uh, shutdowns on women in northeast regions of, uh, of India, um, and also on impact on other communities um, in, in other places that have been affected by internet shutdowns. But from but while, for, while social media blocks and internet shutdowns can and do impact the, the livelihoods uh, of marginalized communities, often if access to the internet is shut down completely or if a popular uh, social media app that you rely on is blocked, that is less likely to go unnoticed. And so uh, usually these sorts of cases receive quite, um, quite a lot of media attention. What concerns me um, probably even more is when the websites of marginalized communities are blocked. Because when such cases do occur, because these websites are either run by marginalized communities or they're run by organizations defending their rights, often such cases of censorship can go unnoticed or uh, may not receive as much media attention in public debate. And so there is the risk that when the voices of marginalized communities are censored, uh, such cases risk remaining in the dark. Through early data over the last 10 years, we have observed numerous cases that involve the blocking of websites defending um, the rights of marginalized communities around the world. Um, examples include the blocking of websites related to ethnic and religious minorities, such as the blocking of um, of Baluch, uh, of Baluch websites in Pakistan, but also uh, the blocking of Kurdish websites in Iran. And we, we also see the blocking of Baha'i uh, websites in many countries, in several countries around the world, uh, such as in Iran. We also observe the blocking of women's rights websites in Iran. And unfortunately, this is something we have observed through the data for many years. And this is ongoing even now in this um, political moment. And we also observe the blocking of LGBTIQ websites in numerous countries around the world. Um, last year, we published an extensive research report which documents the blocking of LGBTIQ websites in at least six countries, including Malaysia, Indonesia, Saudi Arabia, uh, the UAE, um, Iran, and Russia. And what we can see from these cases is that the blocking of such websites can vary uh, across networks. Maybe not all ISPs in a country block access to these websites, and therefore they, there may be less uh, public awareness that uh, such websites are censored. Uh, sometimes the, the, the blocks are implemented in such a way where it may not be obvious to an internet user that these websites are intentionally censored, as it may appear that uh, they may not be able to access uh, due to um, issues with their network or other, other reasons. So this is just to say that um, usually from what we've seen over the last 10 years through network measurements is that a lot of censorship events, a lot of shutdowns tend to be politically motivated. And a lot of them tend to impact marginalized communities. And often there is the risk that when they do impact marginalized communities, um, these cases may not receive much public attention. And so I think it is important to continue monitoring such cases uh, in order to increase transparency and support public debates and uh, support um, their, their rights. And uh, one way to do that um, is through Uniprobe testing, through the, the tool that we provide, and also um, from the public data set that we provide, you can analyze the data and uh, explore and investigate whether there are other cases of censorship and shutdown that are affecting marginalized groups that maybe have gone unnoticed, and you can use that data as part of your own uh, storytelling and advocacy. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Maria. Uh, I would highly encourage each one of you to, you know, uh, look up Oni Probe and Oni App. They're doing some wonderful work, and none of our work, you know, would be complete without, uh, you know, giving due credit to Oni for the amazing measurement work that they're doing. Thank you, Myra, and the team at Oni for uh, doing the wonderful work that they have been doing. I think they're just celebrating 
an anniversary and they've come out with some some really good uh, things and i encourage all of you to have a look at that uh arzur coming to you next and uh, your last but not, definitely not the least uh could you tell us a little bit about what's happening in balochistan and uh, what efforts do you see in pakistan uh, uh, against uh, you know in the fight against shutdowns and the region needs for invasion of fishing uh we have basically a lot of people and organization who connect uh, partner and most importantly learn together to defend the shrinking civic spaces and overcome restrictions to our basic freedoms of assembly association and speech uh, the innovation for change south asia hub is one of the seven regional hubs worldwide uh, spearheaded at the global level by civicus world alliance for citizen participation Uh, we offer services and activities towards the defense expansion and creation of civic spaces and citizen activists across eight south asian countries which includes afghanistan bangladesh bhutan india maldives nepal sri lanka and pakistan where i am based uh, the south asia also provides an inclusive uh, safe space to design ideas for creating an enabling environment for civil society organizations the charities and activists to operate in closed spaces where uh, government restrictions impede uh, the ability of civil society organizations to work together and achieve their missions as my uh, uh, colleagues have mentioned i mean governments worldwide and, and across south asia continue to support uh, sorry uh, sorry to stop you but i think there's some yeah. problem with your audio so you're not very uh, legible Uh, could you maybe adjust your mic settings, and we're also checking here. If is it fine now? I think maybe you can take off your ear pods, and that will help. So we can be fine. Can you say something? You're on mute. Can you say something so that we can check? Can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, this is far better. Is it better? Oh, okay, yeah. perfect. Uh, apologies for that. So, so government across like South Asia uh, continue to deploy internet shutdowns and network disruptions uh, to suppress mass protests, to envision election losses, or reinforce military coups or cut off conflict areas like Balochistan from the outside world. Uh, to report human rights violations and atrocities uh, internet shutdowns exist on a various spectrum and and it include everything from complete back clouds uh, which is basically connectivity is fully shut down or disruptions of mobile services or internet to throttling or slowing down connections to selectively blocking certain platforms as well which is a recent trend that we have seen here uh some internet shutdowns in the region have lasted for weeks and months uh, while other have been going on for years so it's it's something which has become like a favorite tactic of governments to push against uh, mass demonstrations as we saw during the covid-19 period as well uh, despite the growing consensus that internet shutdowns run contrary to established international human rights principles people are becoming frustrated about their seeing inability to help citizens over internet controls and shutdowns uh, once a government imposes an internet blackout uh, there is very little that liberal democracies in the west can do to help citizens immediately to restore connectivity uh, while uh, we have seen that ideas for floating wifi balloons or beaming the internet from satellites have captured the imaginations of politicians in truth these are very costly and workable measures both technically politically and geographically in sensitive area like south asia uh, however that does not mean the democracies cannot exert meaningful pressure against repressive regimes here to ease internet blockouts or that citizen can exercise their creative options to uh, circumvent another controls uh, as one uh, baloch activist put it uh, he is a student activist that it is becoming so frustrating year after year that his entire region has been cut off from rest of the world and it's it's impacting not just only access to information but access to livelihood 
and economic opportunities as well. Despite India being uh, the lead uh, in, in shutting off internet in the region, uh, we have seen that uh, the hardest is areas like Balochistan and, and conference region, region like Jammu and Kashmir have been subject to numerous uh, internet shutdowns under the guise of containing separatist violence, which can last from few days to basically few years as well. Uh, the blackouts uh, shut down Zoom classes for students. Uh, they have stopped e-services for doctors uh, from communicating their patients. And basically, given that we are becoming so dependent on, on internet as a medium for our social life, it is affecting social life of people and disconnecting them from the rest of the globe as well. Uh, given the way our region replicates the bad stuff only, uh, we have witnessed that internet shutdowns are becoming a norm for curtailing free speech under guise of national security or maintaining social harmony. Uh, in, in Pakistan context, especially in Balochistan, we have seen that uh, speed throttling slowing down the internet so that 4G suddenly becomes 2G at, at some point, it's just 1G. Uh, this can stop uh, or has been done to delay news of atrocities or human rights violations or, or reporting uh, military operations that are being taking place from emerging uh, or stopping streaming or uploading of videos uh, as we have seen recently that uh, it has exposed uh, the authoritarian regimes uh, in numerous cases. Speed throttling is also being done in, in, in geographic based blocks as well in Balochistan, West Province, especially where most of the Belt and Road Initiative developments are taking place and where people are uh, protesting against uh, uh, the so called development that is taking place as well. And, and we have seen that. Uh, foreign governments are also helping uh, uh, the state here in ensuring that the uh, internet shutdowns are more targeted, more targeted at different levels. So initially when Pakistan was being shut down, it was all IP uh, based uh, uh, blocking. But in, in recent times, what we have seen that there are either full or partial blackouts, which entail that there's full loss of connectivity and, and, and there can be no regional or national level uh, mobile networks that operate. We have also seen that during military operations or protest or uh, women rights movement that has been happening, there is uh, con uh, the connectivity is substantially slowed down for specific sites like WhatsApp uh, or some segments of the traffic would be uh, halted uh, to uh, ensure that people are unable to share and organize online because most of the uh, social movement that are being organized offline are now being designed online. So the governments are ensuring that uh, access to uh, various social media tools are being uh, halted as well. And then we have also witnessed in the case of Sri Lanka as well that they deep packet inspections are being uh, used to severely cripple down or monitor networks as well. Uh, DPI or basically deep packet inspection, uh, a device or a stingray device is inserted in the network just to surveil on people and, and see the application layers as well. So uh, this technology has been provided by uh, China in, in, in Pakistan as well. And we also see that the same technology was used in, in Sri Lanka during the recent protest movement as well uh, to uh, basically block uh, content and, and applications as well. Uh, Arjun, and then sorry, also... uh, can I ask you to yeah. wrap up in the next 30 seconds? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and then we also have uh, URL based blocking as well, uh, along with non-technical strategies uh, that ensures that uh, SIM cards are being not sold in certain regions or certain people are unable to, or certain ethnicities like marginalized communities are unable to access uh, to the internet. Uh, and, and lastly, I think uh, transparency is very critical in stopping internet shutdowns. Unfortunately, uh, platform and companies do not have policies that are very transparent in terms of uh, how governments are requesting shutdowns or censoring political speech in our region. Thank you, Radhika. Thank you, Arzak. Uh, actually, Arzak brought up a very uh, important point. 
uh, even when we try to reach out to ISPs in at least India, uh, we don't see any, we don't get any response from them, right? You, uh, because obviously the licensing is dependent, uh, I mean, the government gives them licensing. So they don't do really want to talk to us. And I believe that uh, in order to maybe like strengthen the fight against shutdowns, uh, companies and platforms do have a very, very crucial role to play. Uh, wrapping up, uh, I mean, we have like a couple of minutes for an open discussion. I would encourage all of you to, you know, uh, please give us your comments, your questions. Our panelists are here in case you have any uh, questions about any specific region or, uh, you know, any general comments also, which can help us strengthen the fight to let the network. Um, uh, the floor is open. Yes, Malvin. Hi, I'm Malvika from IT for Change India. So I have three questions that um, I would like to uh, ask all the panelists. Basically, uh, first is what is the degree of transparency on the reasons for shutdowns, particularly from the governments, and secondly, from the platforms themselves? And um, I mean, in India, we have a right to information legislation, which definitely won't give us the adequate amount of response. But uh, through your research and your work, how, how are you able to gather this information? Secondly, how much media coverage is present for the kind of internet shutdowns that happen? And uh, do you see a certain kind of politically leaning media organization covering it? Uh, want to understand that. And secondly, uh, I think from the entire discussion here, we see the violation of human rights. We see the test of legality and limitation not actually hitting the mark. So where do we go from here? Thanks a lot, Malika. Yeah, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Frank. I'm from Uganda. I work with the Rural Aid Foundation and I'm um, um, an open internet for democracy leader. And I want to ask one question um, around um, whether we've had any mitigation strategies um, with regard to internet shutdown in those, um, in those areas. But then, the, the, the sec sorry, I have another question. The second question is around, um, um, have you tried to look at the coping strategies that these communities that are affected are actually utilizing to ensure that uh, they overcome the challenges that they face? And uh, if so, what could be some of those coping strategies? Because I believe those would be some of the takeaways for um, um, for us that are working in uh, the same space, that we could be able to adopt some of those strategies in our respective countries and organizations. Thank you so much. Thank you for the very wonderful questions, Frank. I'll go to Felicia, and then if one of our uh, online moderators wants to ask, I think maybe we can take Dan's question also, you know, and we can answer them together. Thank you. Hi, I'm Daniel O'Malley from the Center for International Media Assistance in Washington, D.C., and I've really enjoyed this uh, presentation. I really enjoyed the fact that uh, we talked about throttling, because throttling, I, I come from a media development think tank and research institute, and throttling is one of the ways that internet shutdowns are used to uh, limit access to news information, right? Um, and we have a report uh, uh, out about a year and a half ago about this topic in some of the regions that were actually discussed today. And one of the things that I want to build off of Frank's comment was, you know, unfortunately, we need to do advocacy work to make sure that internet shutdowns don't happen. But we know that they're going to continue to happen. And I think that news organizations, based on my research, have started to find new innovative ways to try and proactively figure out how to respond when they uh, face this challenge. So this is something that I'm really interested in out about, and I'm wondering if our speakers or anyone else in the room um, is interested in that topic as well. Thank you. Last question. I think we'll, yeah, it's just going to be easier to, you know, answer all of them together. Hey, I'm um, sorry. I was actually late, so I don't even know if this topic was <laughs> discussed. Uh, my name is Eduardo. I'm from a civil society in Paraguay called Tadik. I was wondering if it was discussed or if it is of interest of discussion, the issue of perception of internet shutdowns. Because I feel like most of the times we're so caught up on the issue of capturing the data that effectively demonstrates that there was an internet shutdown in a region. And most of the time we overlook, for instance, when communities who are, for instance, in milita militarized areas who feel, and this is the case in, in, in Paraguay, for instance, who they feel that they have been subject to internet shutdowns for numerous reasons, but because there isn't the actual data to provide it, uh, is often overlooked. So I don't know if this is something that could be discussed as well. 
Thank you. Uh, so the way that we'll go is, and because we only have uh, 10 to 12 minutes left, so uh, we'll couple answering these questions with the closing remarks as well. Uh, we'll start with Felicia, and then we'll go in the same order that uh, that you know the speakers came in. You can answer the questions, and you can you know give your last thoughts. Sorry, I think we should generally have like five six days blocked to discuss this. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'll try to answer the questions. Um, yes. It's difficult when it comes to transparency with regards to shutdowns, but I think we've made progress since we started monitoring um, internet shutdowns since 2016. And it's important to note that fighting internet shutdowns requires a coordinated effort. And so that is why civil society, we came together to say that this is a threat to fundamental human rights. This is a threat to democracy. And so we need to join efforts to fight and push back against shutdowns. And I think civil society has done really well in bringing this issue to the spotlight. Um, in terms of media coverage, I think that has also improved. Sometimes we get reports of internet shutdowns due to media reports. And as uh, Prashant mentioned in his presentation, we rely on that to corroborate the information we get on the ground to be able to ascertain and verify what kind of shutdown is happening, what are the reasons behind it, and it's important to always understand the context within which these shutdowns are happening. Um, indeed, we all have seen from this presentation that internet shutdown violates fundamental human rights, and there's been collective, um, I think this is, this issue is not just a priority for civil society, we've seen um, the African Union, the um, United Nations passing resolutions uh, denouncing internet shutdowns and encouraging states to stop imposing them even in times of crisis. Um, we've also seen um, the G7 and the Freedom Online Coalition, which brings together a network of governments, I think over 34 governments, also speaking out against internet shutdowns due to the impact it has. So I think that this is a collective um, fight um, and we need to work together to be able to reach this um, milestone. In terms of mitigation, yes, we have mitigation as part of the Keep It On campaign. We, I will use the elections um, for an example. Elections give us time to plan. Elections give us time to engage with um, authorities. But when you look at the other shutdowns that happen, it's unpredictable and it just happens abruptly and you have to respond. But with elections, we are able to prepare, engage with government through open letters, certain reasons why we think, which we think they also know, that internet shutdowns shouldn't happen during elections. We've seen how shutdowns during elections also mar the credibility of election outcomes. And sometimes you tend to actually have protests when the internet is shut down and the election results are announced. People tend to contest the outcome of the elections. And then we do provide um, circumvention support to people that are experiencing internet shutdowns. And this is incorporated in the strategy we use under the Keep It On campaign, again, around elections, so we build capacity of people to understand what exactly an internet shutdown is, and also to provide them with the various tools, like what kind of uh, virtual private networks can you use? What other strategies? Are you going to rely on foreign SIM cards? Or what, um, we are still trying to find a workaround uh, around complete internet blackouts, but people, I think, have become really resilient. We've seen, how shutdowns have happened in Sudan and how the people have really protested and found ways to come back online and to continue to share information. So I think these are important things um, we've done and we've worked together. And it's important to highlight that we cannot do this alone. It's important to work in solidarity. It's important to have people on the ground running uni tests, for instance, to provide um, the technical evidence which then also provides us information to be able to corroborate that with the context and what exactly is happening. And then we conclude and reach an agreement that, okay, this is actually an intentional disruption. I think there's been some positives and best practices we can also cite in countries. Recently, we worked in Kenya and we did have the government um, making commitments and saying that the internet would not be shut down and the internet was not shut down. So these are things we also have to raise awareness about and to let other countries know that you can hold elections and leave the internet on and keep it on. And finally, my concluding remarks, I just want to say that 
internet shutdowns violate fundamental human rights. I cannot say that enough. And I think that it's important for um, authorities, especially um, in Ethiopia, to take urgent and concrete steps to restore internet access, which um, has been ongoing for the past two years, and to ensure that people come back online, people are able to let the world know what has happen happened over the two years. And also, of course, tech companies also have a responsibility to ensure that um, the concerns that governments use to justify internet shutdowns, they also take concrete steps to ensure that these concerns are addressed so we don't have governments shutting down the internet and citing the fight against misinformation or hateful content on platforms. Thank you. Thank you, Felicia. Uh, so from me, very quickly, um, in regards to the transparency of telecoms orders, I think you have to look um, in all the countries that talked about today, uh, the British Colonial Official Secrets Act, which obviously blocks a lot of these orders from being um, made public. Um, in regards to coping strategies, um, I think the, in Myanmar, the people have just moved back to the old word of mouth um, situation, which obviously has issues in regards to rumors and disinformation and so forth. Um, in regards to um, throttling, I think one thing also to look at is the reverse. So in Myanmar, um, even where they haven't throttled, they've doubled the price of data. And what we've seen the impact of that is, is that now media, many media outlets now do no longer publish um, videos purely because of the people, it's too expensive for their audiences to, to see. And then finally, I think in regards to the um, uh, the responses. I think um, one thing we need to see is um, uh, uh, internet shutdowns are often put into sort of human rights boxes within the UN system, um, which means they're easily sidelined, particularly when there are massive conflict situations, and uh, and they need to be moved into the human humanitarian box also. Um, and this requires different order, uh, different actors to be uh, more involved, particularly UN agencies that are working in, in countries where there are conflicts, like uh, like in Myanmar, because they traditionally um, ignore it. Thank you. Thanks, Oliver. Prashant? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so first on the question of transparency, yes, uh, we, uh, I mean, at uh, Software Freedom Law Center, we've been filing a lot of applications under the Right to Information Act, which often use the uh, word rejected. But thanks to the uh, directions of the Supreme Court in the Andhra Vast case, there's a clear direction to the governments to publish these orders. But even then, these orders are often not published. And these this is more than like uh, in violation of the directions of the court and not in compliance with the let's say, direction of the court. So yes, it's often a struggle to get these orders. Uh, coming to the media coverage, there has been a lot of improvement over the years. And thanks mostly, I would say, to the international media who have covered internet shutdowns in a big way. Uh, then the question of how do we fight these shutdowns? So I would say uh, we need a multi-pronged kind of an approach. One, uh, definitely we need to first document these shutdowns have advocacy in place where all civil society organizations, academia, all need to, let's say, work together, companies also. And then definitely what we have seen in India from our experience is uh, you need to go to the courts and uh, no better way than litigation to fight these shutdowns. Uh, then uh, issues like throttling, uh, yeah, uh, we definitely can look at uh, maybe a technical means of recommending these shutdowns when it comes to issues like throttling. But it's definitely not an easy thing to do. Thank you. Uh, please keep it below one minute. I think they're showing us off now. Uh, so uh, just uh, before the last comments, uh, we have an Optima uh, report launch tomorrow at 9.30 in the large briefing room, which is which will be a continuation of this discussion, I believe. And please be there. But uh, over to you, Maria and uh, Arzak. Thank you, Malvika, um, Frank, and Daniel for your excellent questions. Uh, very briefly, so on the question of transparency, with a tool like Uniprobe, which uh, we provide with my organization, um, the types of experiments you'd be running your network would be able to provide rich network measurement data that shows specifically how an ISP is actively blocking access to a website or to an app. And that level of uh, detail in the technical data can potentially serve as evidence that they intentionally um, blocked access to the service on a specific, in specific moment in time. 
Uh, on the other hand, when it comes to complete internet connectivity shutdowns, there are several uh, public platforms. Uh, there are several platforms which provide uh, open data or public data uh, monitoring internet connectivity worldwide. And um, a lot of these data sets provide signals that can serve also as evidence of uh, intentional shutdowns. And if you're able to see the same signals on many of these different independent data sets, that's an even stronger signal and stronger evidence that a shutdown occurred. On the question of throttling, um, so an open methodology for uh, measuring throttling doesn't exist at the moment, at least not one that has been deployed at scale. Um, but with UNI, what we're, we're currently aiming to do is that we've started research on basically creating new methodologies for measuring throttling, which we'll, we will be integrating into our app. And that way, anyone who uses the UNIPROBE app will be able to measure throttling as well. Um, it is currently possible to infer cases of throttling based on the data we're already um, collecting, but we aim to improve upon that and have more dedicated methodologies over the next year. Uh, thanks. I'm going to be very short. So uh, I think when large tech companies set the agenda for the digital sphere, uh, it can make it more difficult for governments, especially authoritarian regimes, in all contexts to change or counter them. I think large tech companies like Google, Meta, Twitter, and others, they need to come together and support local initiatives and also international civil society organization in pursuing a strategy to counter internet shutdown. I think it also needs to involve non-technological strategies uh, to complement digital solutions uh, to uh, counter internet shutdowns. And I think it's really important that and, and timely that they start supporting these initiatives as well. Thank you.